got a pretty good job. It's hard work, rough hours sometimes, but when you're through, you've done something. Something's moved. I'm on the go all the time, you know. I'm not uh, got a shift from 8 to 4 every day, and I know that's where I'm going to be today, tomorrow, and the next day, and, and uh, I like, like to be on the move. got to go through to work on the railroad. We don't have the best job in the world. We're out in all kinds of weather, and we work under all kinds of conditions. But it's got a whole lot of hardships to go through with. We got on a car and started shoving to North Dallas, and it was freezing. And we shoved five miles, and when we got off the top of the car, our clothes was froze. Cold, hot, sleet, snow, rain. Don't make the sun shine, don't make no difference. Man's got to be there. If you don't be there and be at the right place at the right time, I, it's just too bad. railroad men different is because they feel that they're individuals. You make a trip or you do a, a shift in the yard, there's nobody there performing right on top of that. And when you're finished your shift or your trip, you feel, well, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do and I'm gone home. The job makes you feel as if you're an independent individual. You like change, you like to be, be doing something different all the time, working at different hours. Well, I started on the Great Northern in Haver, Montana, about uh, 14 years ago. I worked three summers for Canadian Pacific on wheat rushes out on the prairie. And then I quit railroading for about a year. And then after I came down from California, I couldn't hire out there. I came over to Arizona and started with Santa Fe, and I've been here ever since. And I like it. This is my main reason for being here, and I like this part of the country primarily. Oh, I just plan to stay about a month and make one good check, and uh, I've been here ever since. <laughs> that's the damn truth. <laughs> Come on, let's I got two. Well, you got 12. We've got a common bind, uh, something that brings you together. Yeah, we spend a lot of lonely hours together away from home waiting for the next freight back. And we don't even get paid for it. You have something to talk about. You have something in common. There's only the one thing a railroad man wants to talk about. That's railroading. Well, he was in the middle of changing clothes, and all he had on was his long underwear. So he decided, well, would nobody see him, so he'd just hop off of the caboose and line the switch in his long underwear. Well, the passenger train came by, and he was so big that uh, we went right on through the pass, and he couldn't catch the caboose. And we left him in this country. Left him from out in the country in his underwear. The uh, closer this conductor would get to his caboose to get on, faster the train went. When the train caboose went by this conductor, well, uh, is going as fast he couldn't get on. And, and he was hollering at this brakeman. He said, don't leave me, don't leave me. He's wanting him to pull the air on the train, you know. Well, instead of the brakeman pulling the air, he just bailed off and stayed with him. Well, he didn't leave him. He just bailed off and stayed right there with him. <laughs> I defy any man that worked on a railroad and not look at an old-time steam engine and not feel a kind of a nostalgia for what was. And there's a sort of a thrill of it all, you know. You used to have to stand up in those old steam engines all the time, and uh, you, know, you just stand there and you just shake. You just shake your insides out of you. That's the way it was. That's, that's exactly the way it was. You kind of got that, that smell of that 
cinders and the, the smoke uh, when, when they started off and the huffing and the puffing. And, uh, I mean, you, you felt like you were doing a man's job. I miss the whistle on the steam engines. They were a lot more colorful than, than the, the air whistle that we have on the, uh, the diesel. Uh, practically all the old timers, uh, they, 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 they had a, oh, I think, a lot different way of blowing the whistle. Each one of them kind of had his own way of pulling the whistle. That was a, it was a beautiful sound, especially in the early morning when the sun was just rising. And, and uh, some, you know, as we used to make the comments, some of the old boys could play a tune on that whistle, you know. And it was colorful. And it, yeah, I think you, you, we have lost something about it. I think it, uh, it had its, its place in life. These people in the freight yard, uh, they didn't have the business that we had in the passenger service, and uh, all of a sudden, in about uh, 10 years, it changed. We lost so much business, and the work so declined that here we were in the reverse. We were trying to affiliate with them. On some railroads, you'll find that uh, they do give you this good service and uh, are interested in passenger business, but uh, as a whole, they're not any of them interested in it anymore. All a railroad really has to offer is service, and if they don't give good service, why they don't get the business. And those that do go by train and like to travel by train, they have a hard time making connections, and uh, their personnel isn't... Uh, the best in the world when you go up to buy a ticket or when you get on a train, you might get some old grouchy conductor that thinks he owns the railroad, which he don't own one bit of it. Well, they have, uh, they, the other day in the paper, said they have 15 trains going and coming in the terminal now. And we used to have 86 or 88 yeah. back in those days. Well, they discontinued them at the old Erie Depot. Well, now, you're, on your tour of duty now, you have to switch the mail hall and 26th Street. Yeah. Our shed, the shed is the biggest job now. The mail hall is very easily satisfied. That's all. Not much switching there. Very easily satisfied. And they don't worry about the mail like they used to. When we started, you know, they used to worry about oh, the mail yeah. being on. But they don't worry anymore. You can put it in there whenever you feel like it. I recently had occasion to go through the depot, um, and my observation was uh, sort of upsetting. And in fact, it was startling. I'd been away from there for a couple of years, and uh, while going through the coach yard, especially where there had always been so much activity, I noticed that uh, many of the tracks had been taken up, small repair shops, uh, machine shop and so forth, those were all abandoned. Uh, the whole thing seemed to be in a state of disrepair. On number nine track, there was uh, nine or ten dining cars, and the thought occurred to me, good Lord, business must be picking up. And then I observed that the numbers had been marked out. They were no longer in service, probably being shipped for scrap or sold to some Latin American country for their services. There's nothing, nothing left today. Five, six years ago, I had so many cars in that coach there when I was on that job that I'd have to take cars out of there, grab a track load, run them up on the lead to make room for cars coming out of the depot to make room in the depot for cars that were coming in off of trains. I get so much room today, I don't know where the hell to do it. Whether they want to do away with the place or not, why, that's what we don't know. We don't understand it. Uh, we, we can't figure out why. We're switchmen. We, we don't run this railroad. 
You just don't know where in the hell the cars are going to, where the trains are going to. The railroads it seemed like uh, they decided at some point there was more money to be made hauling things and hauling people. And then and there, it seemed like they just decided to hell with people, you know. Johnny and me seen the handwriting on the wall, and we got out of passenger. They don't put themselves together, not by a long shot. When we go to work, we know we give them a good eight hours work. And then they've called us feather betters and put a big campaign on and had the Madison Avenue boys publicize it until we had a hard time living down that name. Everybody you meet calls you a feather better, and it always rubs the fur the wrong way. You go home and you say, well, I didn't have to do too much today, and this is what the public thinks, that you don't do anything, and you're getting paid all this money for doing nothing. I think we've gone too long accepting the fact that we're unskilled labor because once we're trained, we're not unskilled because you don't learn it in six months. You don't learn it in a year. Funny thing. You're useless until it comes up time to strike the railroads. And all of a sudden, the government discovers you're so almighty important, the country can't run without you and wham, injunction. They should stop and think about the millions of dollars that the railroads spent uh, advertising feather bedding and educating the general public against the railroad man, which lowered his character, not only in the, in the light of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the layman out here that doesn't understand railroad work, but in your own neighborhoods where you used to be known as Mr. Lucas or Mr. King or Mr. Hennigson or Mr. Benningfield, even the least kid in the neighborhood, oh, there comes old feather bedding. Everybody knows that you can get more work done with three men than you can with two men. And it is a much safer safer practice with three men. Well, look at it right now. you got no firemen. There's no firemen on the, on the side, so how are you going to... You're going to pass signals to the hog unless you've got a man on the leading car and you're on the, on the top of the, of the other car. You can't do it. Yes, more men, so you can relay signals. I was walking across the top in the dark, checking for handbrakes, and I started to step across. There was no catwalk. The roof of the car was smooth and frosty, and I slipped and fell. I could have gone right off the top of the car on the ground and got hurt. Well, you get down badly hurt. The day that I came off, I just about killed myself, too. I saw you in the east end there, flat on his back. Came down like that, right down on his back. I mean, the job's fine, but not to get hurt over. That's a long way down. There isn't a man on the railroad that hasn't come close to dying more than once. They preach safety, but uh, just see how much uh, safety there is in the yard. It is a death trap. You could kill yourself at any instant. Jenner, I believe we've got a little smoke over here on my side. Let me 
don't you look over there. He might be going over your side now, disappeared here. Yep, yeah. got a little smoke. It smells like a hot box to me. Uh, I don't know where it's hot box or where it's a great stick. But we better stop and inspect it. Stop now. We got a hot box up here, about three cars. Yeah, the boo's over here. Smell that thing. Uh, doctor, this thing over there, I think we can go on in, okay? Oh, okay, okay. They got these hot box detectors, see? And they're supposed to be automatic. But, uh... <laughs> Just the same, you better keep your eye open. Because you don't want a derailment caused by hot boxes didn't get automatically detected. We'll pull water on it. I hate to pull water on it, but we're going to have to cool it down a little bit or it ain't going to go. Here's a hook right here. Let's get some water in the air. We do have a dangerous job, and uh, it used to be where uh, if you were a switchman, you had to pay a higher rate of insurance than for anybody else. And that's why the V of R T started their own insurance, so that uh, the men could have insurance without paying this high rate. Officers and members of W.A. Ring Lodge No. 425, the duties of my office require me to preside at all meetings of this lodge, to require a strict compliance to the Constitution and general rules, that the business of this lodge may be conducted in a manner looking to the best enters to the Brotherhood of Railway Trainmen, that each head bow the reverence to the supreme ruler of the universe while the chaplain invokes a divine blessing. Most holy and glorious Lord God, the great ruler of the universe, the Brother Railroad Train has been greatly responsible for many improvements in our agreements, but uh, many of our young men who are coming into railroading today are stepping into this, and they think it's gravy, and they think it was given to them by the, by the carriers and the companies. There doesn't seem to be a great drive among the um, brothers. Nobody seems to have any interest in it. The thing is, the guys themselves, they don't want to do anything. There's no drive. They seem to be all stale. They're too fat. Everybody's too fat. The young men hiring out today have no realization of what in the hell has gone on before them. They don't care. They, they automatically think that they're entitled to these things. Well, you're not entitled to them. Somebody fought long and hard for these conditions. You should respect them. The way a lot of the older guys talk, you'd think they own a union, and they don't. Sure, it was tough in the old days, and a lot of guys got killed to get where we are. But no good now talking about 50 years ago. The problems we've got today, we have to solve today. Griever, he says, what you call him that for? Why don't you call him Shop Stewart, like in any other union? Well, sir, I says, we call him Griever because on the railroad he gets nothing but grief. Is there any way we can get a footbridge put across there? Uh, either that or we got to walk clear down to Freedom Station and back up around to line them switches over there. Well, they sure don't want you crawling over cars. They preach safety. That's, that's an unsafety practice. It's an unsafe practice, but if you take time to walk down around, then you're killing, your, killing time. You're not doing your job right. Well, perhaps that's the answer, then. Just take your time. The longer it takes, why, uh, well, the better chance you've got of solving your problem. That's the only way I see to do it is just walk down around because crawling over those trains is a hazard. You ain't got no way to know if you're going to start shoving or pull the track or what's going to happen. You don't know there's road engines on some of them trains when you go crawl across them. And if you get hurt, they'll hang you. Stand for Griever? I said, what do you think? I got rocks in my head? And some men are bring up new grievance every day. They're real geniuses when it comes to finding grievances. I'll tell you what I don't like. I don't like the amount of time it takes to get a grievance settled. 
That's right. We got cases anywhere from one to more than five years old. But as long as they're pending before the adjustment board, we can't do anything but wait. I mean, under the Railway Labor Act, we can't even take a strike vote. Something I think in the future that's got to be brought in to B of RT contracts and hasn't been is the training of the head end brakeman. Here he goes making his first or second trip. He doesn't know where he's going, what he's going to do. He's just going. I had a student with me the other day, and he's been working for three weeks. The only signal that he knew was the sign to go and eat. I think they're pulling some sharp practice on us. Our rest was up at 440, and they ordered that extra crew out at 415, 25 minutes before our rest. I don't think that's right, do you? The laws are too complicated. You got to have a local chairman who really knows his stuff. And even then, you wait forever before the carriers give up anything. You can't be president of the Brotherhood of Dray Road Trainmen by sitting behind a desk in Cleveland, and you'd better not try. You've got to get out on the ground, find out what the complaints are, and try to do something about them. Being in there, if you can't, you try to send an officer in there to correct them. And it's nothing unusual for them to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'll admit it's rather provoking, but I consider it part of my job. So they go in for a raise on those kind of jobs, on the annual pay that they make as a bricklayer, as a plumber, or as a carpenter. Well, we've got to go in on what our annual take-home pay is, or what our annual pay is. And there's no use kidding you, they, they don't bring the, the little checks in, they exhibit the big checks. And we've got some switchmen, that brother, they're making a fair-sized paycheck. I don't mind telling you. Yeah, I'd like to get back on the issue, if I can, of safety. Now, uh, safety in most of the yards that we have here in the Chicago region, uh, particularly one at the 63rd Street uh, yard there. Now, we had a lot of injuries over there. They pull off the right of right in Clarellis, but they still haven't uh, stopped the issue of uh, accidents and that. They got uh, one utility man, I think, on uh, one trick. And he's supposed to cover all 42 tracks down there. I'm also a member of the safety committee of Lots 225, and I've had many complaints from the uh, brakemen and conductors uh, that uh, perform services there. And uh, in the uh, uh, in between the tracks, uh, the company does not clean up uh, the rubble, and they do not uh, clean up the, the, the various objects of debris. There's dung and all kinds of things that come out of stock cars. There's unsafe and slick conditions. Your field man, when he goes down there, is constantly like that. He won't even sprinkle sand or anything over it. I would suggest this, and I used to do it myself. I would write him a letter and be on record with him. Tell him if someone could get seriously injured or killed, I'd write him a letter on the condition of the yard and tell him someone could get seriously injured or killed. And at the same time, I'd keep that record. If you give the dates and figures to your local chairman when this happens, I'm sure he can correct some of it. I'm sure of that. Well, yes, I'd like to ask you one point blank question. Do we have to go to work shorthand? Well, I'm going to answer you. Like yes or no? I'll, I'll answer you. Case, I'll give you the number of it. A man got up and uh, said that he didn't have to go to work shorthanded and asked the general chairman that. He said, no, you don't. But they're going to fire you for it. Now, if you've got guts enough and time enough, we'll get you back and pay you for it. Now, you, me, or nobody can tell you they can't fire you. The only thing we can do if they fire you unjustly is make them pay you for it. Now, that's how simple it is. Well, is it unjustly to go to work shorthand? I'm telling you, you don't have to, but they'll fire you. Well, you're, you're the president. I, I'm telling you. It's a concrete statement, yes or no? I told you. You, you haven't said yes I or said no? I said you don't have yes to, but they'll no. fire you. Huh? They'll fire you for insubordination. In other words, we have no, the union has, we have no backing from the yes, union. Yes, you do. We have up. backing for the union, but you also got laws, you got a Railroad Labor Act, and you've got court decisions that's already been decided on this. 
Well, the only thing I know, if, 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 if uh, I was the president of the union, I would automatically tell my men what they had to do or wouldn't have to I do. I think I've told you what Point that blank. Is. You told me I have to go to work. I told you if you <laughs> are going to go to work, work or get fired for insubordination. Now, can you hear it any plainer? If I go to work or get fired. All right, now, let's face the issue. I don't care who you are or where you come from. It's never been a union in existence that can keep a company from firing a man. Never has yet. Because that's my job to keep up with it. But the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen has made them pay them for firing more men than any union in the United States. And I can back it up. Amen. We call it the fire hole. If you ever see it, you'll never forget it. But that's progress, I guess. Get rid of the old, make way for the new. I believe the railroads are going through a big change and eventually they will come back. Between the government pushing and the brotherhood pulling, maybe the railroads will get moved into the 20th century yet. The carriers may not care about passengers, but the government does, and the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen does. Now, if you'd asked me five years ago, I'd have said passenger had no future. Not today. You think the railroads don't belong in the jet age? <laughs> Take a look at that new turbo train. Uh, when you look at the problems city people have getting uh, uh, to and from work and uh, how the cities are growing, uh, you, you can see a great future for passenger service. Seems like everybody can see it but the railroads. They could compete with the airplanes if they wanted to because there are a lot of people that don't like to ride planes and uh, there is a certain thrill about riding on a train. Uh, let's just put it this way, we're, we're living better today than we're enjoying a better salary, we're enjoying better working conditions, better safety features, and they are trying to improve it all the time. It's going to open up someday, a man in the future is going to have a lot better job than I got. I think that is their goal, to improve our jobs, and they have. we come a long way, and we're still moving. where you do a, a shift in the yard, there's nobody there performing right on top of that. And when you're finished your shift or your trip, you feel, well, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do and I'm gone home. The job makes you feel as if you're an independent individual. You like change, you like to be, be doing something different all the time, working at different hours. Well, I started on the Great Northern in Haver, Montana, about uh, 14 years ago. I worked three summers. Man, you have to be there. If you don't be there and be at the right place at the right time, I, it's just too bad. Railroad men different is because something's moved. I'm on the go all the time, you know. I'm not uh, got a ship 
from eight to four every day, and I know that's where I'm going to be today, tomorrow, and the next day. And and I, I like like to be on the move. But the people, a whole lot of people don't realize what a man's got to go through to work on the railroad. We don't have the best job in the world. We're out in all kinds of weather, and we work under all kinds of conditions. But it's got a whole lot of hardships to go through with. We got on a car and started shoving to North Dallas, and it was freezing. And we shoved five miles, and when we got off the top of the car, our clothes was froze. Cold, hot, sleet, snow, rain. Don't make the sunshine, don't make no difference. Good job. It's hard work, rough hours sometimes, but when you're through, you've done something 